Please join me in welcoming Lulu Garcia Navarro. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to World Oregon. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. Um, thank you to World Oregon. Thank you also for your presence here. I understand that we are having typical weather here in Portland. Um, so I'm pleased that you brought it indoors and uh, decided to take a break from the first day of spring to come and uh, spend some time with me today. Uh, I've come directly from uh, the swamp, as the president likes to call it, or uh, Mordor, as other people in the other side of the aisle like to call it. And I'm here to talk to you today about news in the age of noise. I'd like to start, I think, uh, by reminding you what happened last week, which I'm sure seems already lost in the mists of time. It, it does to me. So I'm just gonna run through what happened last week. The big stories. On Monday, Stormy Daniels, who says she had an affair with the president, offered to return the money she was given by the president's lawyer to stay silent. On Tuesday, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was fired via tweet. On Wednesday, tens of thousands of students walked out across the country from their schools to, schools to protest gun violence. On Thursday, the US put sanctions in place against Russia for election meddling. And on Friday night, Andrew McCabe, the former deputy FBI director, was fired a scant few days before he could receive his full pension benefits. Uh, he said it was because of the Robert Mueller investigation. The president's lawyer said the investigation should be scrapped, and that prompted endless reaction. That was just last week. So does any of this sound vaguely familiar? Uh, hard to recall? It is for me. Uh, so I went around the newsroom in advance of this speech um, to interview a few people you may recognize, some you may not, about what it's like as journalists to cover the news these days. Listen. My name is Ollie Dearden, and I am the supervising producer at All Things Considered. And what is it like dealing with the news these days? It's like trying to attach a hose to a hydrant that has already been opened while there's a burning building next door with puppies inside and you have to be able to put it out in time, but you can't attach the hose, and everyone's looking at you and going, why can't you do that? That's what it's like. Uh, I'm Gene Demby. I'm the co-host of the Code Switch podcast. I'm a correspondent for Code Switch. And every morning when I wake up, uh, we get the, you see the New York Times news alerts, you see the NPR alerts, um, and sometimes you just have to not watch the news because you have, as journalists, we have to like focus on the stuff we're doing. We can't sort of jump onto the next thing, and it's so hard to figure out just generally like what we're supposed to be paying attention to because it seems like everything is on fire all the time and everything seems so urgent. Uh, it makes it harder for us to uh, determine like what matters from day to day because the stuff that seems to matter or that traditionally has mattered, the life cycle of it now is literally ours, right? I mean, a couple of weeks, just last week ago, just last week, we were talking about one of Trump's aides going onto CNN and having what looked like a meltdown uh, over the course of a day. And like two days later, no one was talking about that. Um, and it happens, it happens all the time now. And it's probably not a good thing uh, for uh, our democracy, but it, uh, more specifically, it presents a, a unique set of challenges for us as journalists. My name is Don Gagne. I cover national politics for NPR. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. I feel like uh, I am challenged more by virtue of the fact that I'm a member of this profession. Not even so much that I work for this organization, but that I am a journalist. So I have to represent what we are and what we do for society and what we do for a democracy, uh, even as I'm gathering information for my stories. And it sounds like it might be kind of a delicate line to walk, but really it's not, because it's easy to be myself and it's easy to be what we are. And just doing that, I find, challenges uh, what they think we are and what they think somebody like myself does. What do you say when, what do you say when someone says, you know, you're a journalist, you're just fake news? I say, listen to my work. And sometimes I hand them my business card. 
and I say, we have a show on tomorrow morning. You listen to it. And if you hear something on there that you think is fake news or that is biased in any way, there's my cell phone number. Call me, and I'd love to talk to you about it. And you know something? They never call. One guy called and said, I owe you an apology. It was, I remember it, he was in Shreveport, Louisiana when I met him, uh, you know, in front of an oil rig. And uh, he was kind of needling me about being NPR and you guys are liberals and everything else. And I did that drill. I gave him my card. I said, you listen tomorrow morning and you call me after you've listened. And he called me and he apologized. Okay, my name is Jordana Hochman and I'm the supervising editor at Weekend Edition. Friday afternoon is, I think I have things in shape for, uh, for Saturday's program and Sunday's program, and then we start to get these little, um, these email messages from our politics team, and they start to see, we're giving you guidance because we're hearing rumors that so-and-so is going to be fired, or something is going to be reorganized, or, somebody, or some country is going to decide that they're going to negotiate with the United States after, you know, I don't know, decades of, of non-communication. So you just, like, you just say, you just kind of like expect that, you file that away and you think, okay, it's gonna be Friday at about 3 p.m., 4 p.m. and something crazy is going to happen and I'm just going to reorganize everything. And you just like, you feel a bit of panic but you mostly just like let it roll off you and you start again. My name is Ari Shapiro. I'm one of the hosts of All Things Considered. And in the 15 years that I've been at NPR, one of the things that I've realized is as people become more skeptical of journalism and they don't know what's true, we have to be more transparent about how we do the work we do. If we're using an anonymous source, we should explain why we're using an anonymous source. If there are things that we don't know, we have to explain what we don't know in addition to what we do know. That level of transparency is something that I don't think reporters were used to practicing when I was starting in the business, and I think it's a good thing that we're doing more of it now to respond to the news climate that we work in. You are in a national news program um, that is daily. Every single day you have to sort of deal w with what's um, out there. What is it like to deal with this amount of news? For me, the big challenge is that we used to be in a news cycle where a big story would happen, and over the course of three days or a week, we would approach that story from different angles, and we would get different voices to look at it, and we would contextualize it in a lot of different ways. Now, there are three stories of that size every day. And so we have to prioritize, and we have to think while we're covering those things, how do we also bring in the joy and the surprise and the uplift? And inevitably, people kind of get whiplash from going from this thing to the next thing to the thing after that so quickly. It's a faster pace of news than I've ever experienced before. My name is Didi Skanke, and I'm the deputy international editor. News these days is like a tsunami. It's just, it's just, it's overwhelming. It washes us all away. We're on, we're on all platforms all the time. Um, and it's frankly too much for anybody to get their arms around and we just keep trying to swim with the tide. Does anyone sleep anymore? <laughs> no, I don't actually, I mean, who needs it? You, no, don't sleep anymore. <laughs> who needs it? We don't need it, certainly not. My name is Scott Simon. And you know, these days, I just don't get any rest. Something happens every few hours. Something happens every hour. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't shut your eyes. You can't play with your children. I mean, something happens every 30 seconds. You keep up with it. That's what I want to say to people. Ah, you do it. I'm tired of keeping track of everything. There's Scott. That's his message to you. Um, there is something that happens to me. I'll just add my own anecdote. Um, Inevitably, and I think I think he must set his watch by it. I, I'm sitting in the studio. Uh, the show starts at 8 a.m. East Coast time, and two minutes to 8 a.m., the president will start tweeting. Two minutes, always, always. And so it's not even that you have a second to decide what you're going to put on air. Uh, you're having to respond to that right away. So what we just heard there, uh, some key words, puppies in a building for sure. Um, but we heard overwhelming, relentless, exhausting, I can attest to that, accountability, transparency, fake news. I'm gonna delve into the world of the media today. Uh, I may use the word 
specifically, though. I want to describe what I mean by the media. Actually, there is no such thing as the media. Uh, the media landscape has a lot of different organizations with different levels of accountability, editorial slants, editorial oversight. Just to give you an example, Alex Jones of Infowars, who claimed that the kids killed at Sandy Hook were crisis actors, or th and that uh, a democratic pedophilia ring was being operated out of a DC pizzeria, has a blue check mark on Twitter. And so do I. And his stuff wasn't true, by the way. Um, I'm going to remind you of this a little later, uh, but I feel like I need to establish right away that we are operating now in a very confusing media landscape for the average person. But when I talk about media journalism today, I'm talking about the fact-based variety, unless otherwise noted. And it's sad that I have to make that clear. So I've taken you into our newsroom so you can get a sense of what it's like every day there. So for me, I head into work at the beginning of the week, and I feel, and I actually visualize this in my head, like I'm walking into a hurricane and that I'm clinging to this small sapling that any minute could blow away. And in the middle of all that, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out what really matters, what news is important, what do listeners really need to hear? As you heard there in that lovely introduction, I spent most of my career abroad. I've covered eight major wars, many of which I didn't just drop into. I actually lived in the countries that were in conflict. I spent most of my 30s in Iraq. <laughs> um, I've covered er hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, riots, terror attacks. I've been expelled from Cuba for my reporting. I've had to operate under the radar in Venezuela. I've had to navigate the shifting alliances of insurgent groups. I've been shot at. I've actually had to swim out of my car during a hurricane in Mexico, and I was rescued by the Mexican Marines. It was not my finest moment. Uh, I think you get the point that I've seen a lot of stuff. But what I am experiencing here in the United States is like nothing I have ever dealt with. The wonderful journalist Uki Goni from Argentina, who writes for The Guardian, recently tweeted, journalism in the US, they used to say, was the sound of a nation talking to itself. Now it's the sound of a nation gone mad. And on a bad day, it can really feel like that. I returned to the US right after the election of Donald Trump, after more than two decades overseas, and the past 15 months have led me to this conclusion. American journalists acknowledged that they were blindsided by the election of Donald Trump because they didn't see it coming. The most consequential election in recent memory, and almost everyone got it wrong, on the left and on the right. Why? Why? Everyone was focused on the campaign rallies, the inside baseball DC machine. They were looking inwards to what they knew and the people that they knew, and not outwards to the rest of the country. And after the election, I'm sure you heard it, there was a lot of hand-wringing and promises to do better. But have we? Many news organizations are doing it again, doing it again. You only have to turn on the cable news channels, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, and there is something glaringly missing these days. Have you noticed it? Actual reporting on the ground from anywhere. Unless there's a shooting or a disaster, the vast majority of the airtime is spent with journalists and pundits in DC talking to each other about their own articles, talking about one thing, and that's Mr. Trump. The press, and this is the left and the right, is in a symbiotic relationship with the president, in my view. Now, we know the president watches a lot of television. On Monday alone, he tweeted about Sean Hannity being on Fox and Friends, it's his favorite show. Um, and the fact that we know what his favorite show is is kind of telling. Um, he's become the chief media critic of our time. He's lobbed the word fake news into our lexicon and he's highlighted both positive and negative articles on Twitter with abandon. As long as it's about him, it seems, he's willing to highlight the coverage and we're all grateful for that. Um, we journalists, we get a lot of flack. On the left, we're blamed for the rise of Donald Trump. Then we are blamed for the normalizing of Donald Trump. 
On the right, journalists of the fact-based press are blamed for bias, for bias against Donald Trump and of being, as Steve Bannon put it, the opposition party. In short, everyone, everyone's a critic, which is fine, which is fine. Um, but here's one fact. Donald Trump is actually the president, which means, hey, y'all on the left, his tweets are news. They actually put his tweets on official White House stationery that go out in press releases. It's kind of amazing. Um, we get them. It's incredible. Um, sometimes all in caps as he writes them. Um, and his tweets, they change policy. They move markets and also, and this is why I think they're interesting, they give a great insight into the man and what he wants. You know what he's thinking. You know what he's watching on television. Um, but also, hey on the right, his actions need to be scrutinized and investigated because he is the president and this is a democracy and the press is doing its job. So the president knows uh, that we follow everything he does. He even jokes about it. He says, if he wasn't president, we'd all lose our jobs in the media because no one would be tuning in. And I have to say, there are certain days when I feel like we end up chasing our tails and losing sight of the other stories that matter. On my show, I'm adamant. I, the, that little sapling that I told you about, that I kind of, in my head, am clinging onto when I go into work, this is the sapling, that we look beyond the beltway. This is what I tell the people that I work with. We've got to look beyond where we are and see what else is out there. What stories are we missing? What communities are we not hearing from? I take my show on the road to many parts of the country and abroad. I was recently in Pennsylvania for the 18th district race, and it was so illuminating. And it's something that I couldn't have understood unless I'd gone there myself and talked to people. It's uh, a fascinating part of the country where uh, coal meets the wealthy suburbs. And it's a place that went for Donald Trump by 20 points in the last election. But they just elected a Democrat, Connor Lamb, for a vacant House seat. So there's a conversation that's happening there that people kept on kind of mentioning. People are engaged in politics in a way that they haven't been before. Uh, I met one woman in the public library who told me that women were kind of gathering in small groups, organizing, talking. And we know that women were pivotal in the recent election as they were in 2016. Uh, Connor Lamb won because some suburban white women flipped. So there are shifts happening. And I got an inkling of them because I actually went there and talked to people. And I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't have predictions for the next election. But I know that I got to see something and report on something that people should hear about and they should know about. So my advice for ourselves in the fact-based media is I think we need to uncouple from the president. Conscious uncoupling. The Russia investigation is really important and fascinating. Um, I love reading about Hope Hicks, and if you haven't read the uh, New York Magazine article about her, it's great. Um, there are stories that need highlighting and investigation. Um, but there are many stories happening all over this country and around the world, international stories, local stories, that can no longer get play in the paper and on TV and radio because the time and resources are all spent reporting stories about the latest Trump meltdown that no one can remember two days later. We, me we need more reporting on the ground. We need to go there, we need to talk to people, we need to get a sense of what people think and we need to back it up with real reporting, with facts. And it's a kind of gumshoe reporting that has become even more urgent because of one major thing. And, and now I'm gonna explain to you a little bit what this media landscape looks like because it's not just about the choices that we're making right now as news organizations and as reporters, there's something else that's going on. And actually, there's a few things that are going on. But the first is the collapse of local news. 
This is a tough time for journalists. Our industry is being decimated. Quietly last week, so I listed the things that happened in the main news, but quietly last week, the newsroom of the Denver Post was cut down even further. On the same day, the same thing happened at the Chicago Tribune, yet again. These are the latest and endless rounds of cuts. Uh, yes, it may be the golden age for the New York Times and the Washington Post, organizations that are doing fantastic reporting, as is NPR. But I don't think it's a sign of a healthy media ecosystem. Most major news organizations are located on the coasts and actually between New York and DC. Most journalists at major news organizations are actually covering what happens in Washington. Most major news organizations are overwhelmingly white and we tend to focus on big picture stories of national impact. Local papers, when you have them, are now expected to do much more with almost nothing. There is no staff to look into a company dumping toxic waste. There's no staff to cover school board meetings. If you're lucky, you have one local paper left in your area. There are huge swaths of the country that have none. Local news organizations are uniquely suited to have a relationship with the people that they cover. Their loss, I feel, and studies have shown, has created a big void. So, enter social media. The fact is that now most news organizations rely on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get our stories to you. That has made you the editor of your own daily news feed. Congratulations. You choose what news you see or what news your friends see by sharing and liking certain things. Uh, and so we all know by now the danger of these ideological bubbles. But that's not what I'm going to talk about here. We in the media don't have control over what you see because algorithms created by unaccountable social media companies staffed by 20-year-olds who have had little exposure to life are the new gatekeepers that are actually influencing how you view the world. And none of these social media giants pay for the news they disseminate while making really big profits. They don't vet what they put out while being the most important por portal where many Americans get their news. They are media companies in almost every sense, except they pretend they're not bound by journalism's values or obligations. They call themselves platforms, unconstrained by ethical constraints. And as we're continuing to learn, the void of reliable reporting by trusted sources and social media has helped the rise of real fake news. Now, I know that's an oxymoron. But the stuff I'm talking about here is disinformation, deliberately crafted to change people's minds, upset them, divide them. I am very careful what I share online. But even I have sent out stories that were made up and untrue uh, because they were shared by a credible friend or a colleague online. And I didn't bother to check the source or because it seemed like it was written by a credible source. They're really clever, the way that they can sort of mirror real news organizations. I'm a trained media professional and I am also a victim of fake news. Now, I want to put this into context a little bit because there's a bit of hysteria around this right now, this idea of fake news. We should remember that fake news, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, is actually nothing new. It goes back to the very foundation of how America became an independent country. Look at the very first eyewitness account of the Battle of Lexington. Isaiah Thomas was the founder of the Massachusetts Spy newspaper, and he saw the first shot of the Revolutionary War fired. He reported that bloodthirsty redcoats were to blame. And his newspaper relentlessly spread what would now be called propaganda. Historians now believe he lied in the service of American patriotism. But this is a different era, and we face different challenges. I'm going to talk about something that's been in the news this week. I don't know if you've been following the story of Cambridge Analytica. 
Yes, I, I, I hear from the murmurings you may. Uh, it's a data company, for those of you who may not know, that was financed by the Mercers, uh, the Republican billionaire father and daughter, and was supported by Steve Bannon. And they obtained 50 million Facebook profiles uh, here in the US with the aim of targeting voters and influencing them. And the UK's Channel 4 News over the past few days went undercover. And I don't know if you saw their documentary, but it was pretty astounding. And they filmed one of their executives, um, who I think today was just dismissed, pending an investigation. And he was boasting about how they are for hire to sow disinformation. And this is what he said. He said, quote, we just put information into the bloodstream of the internet, and then we watch it grow. We give it a little push every now and then, like a remote control. It has to happen without anyone thinking that's propaganda, because the moment you think that's propaganda, the next question is, who put that out? And he also said, many of our clients don't want to be seen to be working with a foreign company. So we often set up fake IDs and websites. We can be students doing research projects attached to a university. We can be tourists. There are so many options we can look at. I have lots of experience in this. How influential are these tactics? I think it's impossible to know right now. Uh, they aren't new. They've been used in Latin America for a long time. But this disinformation gets amplified in all sorts of ways these days. Those Russian bots and trolls we all heard about, it gets amplified unknowingly by regular people. But also it gets amplified by the mainstream media. We are the biggest megaphone there is. And if they can get a sordid story on an opponent out in the mainstream press, it's gold. So that sounds pretty bad, right? Sounds like I'm admitting something. I want you to know, because the one thing that Ari Shapiro brought up there is that people don't really understand what it is that we do and what separates the fact-based press from other types of organizations. What makes us different um, other than, yeah, we try and tell facts, but, but there's other stuff that goes into it. We have guardrails. Uh, let me tell you what it takes to get a story out in a big news organization. A regular story, not an investigative report, just a regular story. Every fact is checked. There has to be multiple sources for every assertion. And there is not just one editor, but multiple editors who will look at a story and make sure it's right. Editors are not only looking at whether a big assertion is true, uh, so-and-so paid off that person to get his permit expired, but also they check if the building you ri you're writing about is actually on the street that you say it is. I've been caught out with that. I said it was one street, it was another one. Um, a lot goes into this. So think about the stories about Roy Moore written by the Washington Post. A right-wing group tried to scam the Post by sending um, a fake victim. And the Post discovered pretty quickly that it was a scam. And that isn't to say that we don't get it wrong. Of course we get it wrong spectacularly wrong sometimes because we're journalists and we're people and we write down information incorrectly and the pace of news is dizzying and our editors miss a key detail. But there is a second thing that the fact-based media does that sets it apart from unreliable outlets. We tell you when something is wrong. We correct it and we apologize. And if the mistake is big enough, People get fired, and there is an investigation. But there is something slightly trickier. That's kind of the easy stuff. What do we do when, let's say, we get information that's legitimate, but it's come from dubious sources? Let's say hacked emails that are true, but they're provided by bad actors to influence people. What do we, what do, we do then? What is our responsibility? How do we decide what to publish? A lot of thought goes into that as well. And it's not clear cut. We mostly try and weigh the public's right to know. The public's right to know. Because really, we're doing this for you. So this is when I'm actually going to address you. The consumers of news. 
this is what I have to tell you. Consume news from sources that you trust. And that trust shouldn't be because the news organization tells you things that you want to hear. It should be because even if they get it wrong, they are accountable. You know that they actually did some fact checking. They think about why they are publishing something. Also, you need to widen your diet of news. Make sure you're getting your news from a few different places and perspectives. But more than anything, because I think you kind of understand that now, but more than anything, you can no longer just passively sit back and get your news from your social media feed. At best, it's gonna give you a very narrow view of the world, and at worst, you may be part of the problem. I'm guilty of this. I don't have time to read the whole New York Times or the Weekly Standard, so I get my news from Twitter, and I get my news from Instagram, and I get my news from my Facebook feed and my friends, and I got a lot of smart friends, so I get a lot of good news. But being an informed citizen actually means you have to work for it. I mean, I like Facebook and Twitter because I get all sorts of different perspectives. And it's important to get those perspectives. If you think about the media as the gatekeepers we used to be, um, we used to have Tom Brokaw sitting behind his desk and there were three channels and that gave you a very singular view of the world. And now there are all sorts of voices coming up that are very important to hear and they're using social media to amplify themselves and, and to get their message out. And so I think it's really important that we have that. But because everything is scream, everyone is screaming about something on Twitter or Facebook doesn't actually mean it's something that matters very much. You can filter out the noise. That doesn't mean you shouldn't stay engaged. You know, there's a whole push by some people to be like, I don't want to hear it anymore. You know what, I don't want, if I have to hear that man in the White House say one more thing, I'm just gonna switch off the TV. Or if I have to hear those people in the mainstream media bash that man in the White House one more time, I'm gonna turn off the news. You know, you can't afford to do that. We need you. We need you to pay for the news, to read it, to think critically about it, to engage, to question it. We are in this together. We are not the enemy of the people. We are of the people. I have worked in many countries where people in power try to demonize journalists. I've worked in countries that jail us. I've worked in countries that kill us. I've lost friends. I've lost colleagues, too many, who believed one simple thing, and that is, it is important to go where the story is and to tell that story to the world. And they died for that. I've been at their funerals, and I've seen their families weep. America has always been this beacon for the free press. We have our rights enshrined in the first article of the Constitution. Do you know what a powerful symbol that is in places where the press gets told what to report and if they deviate from that, they are fired or worse? This is a privilege that we have here. I recently interviewed the anchor from Univision, Jorge Ramos, who, uh, if you will recall, was thrown out of a press conference by then candidate Trump for asking uh, about President Trump's uh, immigration policies. And Jorge Ramos told me about why he came as an immigrant, why he left Mexico, which he loved, and came to the United States. And it was because he was told he could not report a story there that would embarrass the government. And so he came here to this country because he said he knew that he could report here without fear or favor. So that term fake news used by our president is being used to dismiss now legitimate reporting across the world by re repressive regimes. We're hearing that, that phrase used in the Philippines, in Israel, uh, in Brazil. 
anything that anyone doesn't like is now called fake news. I'm reminded of this, of our Constitution and, and why people come here and how people from other countries see the United States because I am also an immigrant. I only recently became a citizen. And I'll tell you what struck me sitting there in that hall where I took the oath. And it was how important the first three words of the Constitution are. We, the people, we, all of us, we must make sure that we preserve that perfect union. We must make sure that we are not divided. Thank you, and with that, I'll take your questions. Good evening, I'm Derek Olson, the president of World Oregon, and I'm going to be reading some of the questions from the audience. Thanks for that wonderful talk. Dive right into a question from uh, a junior at Sunset High School in Beaverton. Mm -hmm. Can media and journalists have too much power? Yes, um, absolutely. I don't know quite what you mean by that, but, um, but we do. We have an inordinate amount of power. Um, it's called the mass media for a reason, uh, the reach of, of what we choose to uh, privilege as important um, is, is, has an enormous impact. Uh, think about when you're turning on the television or when you're opening the newspaper or what you see on your social media feeds. We have a lot of power to shape the way um, things are viewed and, and the conversations that people are, happening, are, are having. And so, yeah, I think we, we do and can have uh, too much power, and that's why a lot of thought has to go into how we wield it and how we um, disseminate it, and who is telling you the news? I mean, this for me is a very personal issue because you have to think about, you know, what are the sources of, of your news? And I don't only mean, um, you know, not credible sources who are lying to you and using disinformation, but also, um, you know, what is the racial and ethnic makeup of the people that are giving you new, your news? What are um, their backgrounds? Where do they come from? What do they think? Um, you know, all these things feed into uh, how we talk about things and how you understand them. And so it is a conversation that's happening back and forth. Um, but yeah, uh, we do have a lot of power, unquestionably. So we got a couple of questions about uh, profit-driven nature of news, and this question specifically is, today's news outlets are owned, many, by giant for-profit-driven corporations, more interested in ratings than facts. How do we fix that, and is a non-profit news model like ProPublica a possible answer? So, um, I have to say, I, I, I do, even though I did bash some of the um, cable news channels, I really, I have a lot of colleagues um, who work in television news, and um, they are not just interested in ratings, they are interested in facts. And so I, I really, dis first of all, dispute that. Um, but I will say that that is the big challenge that we have. Uh, at the moment, um, the media has not found a model that can sustain us uh, when digital, um, social media um, came on, we were slow to understand what it would really mean. Uh, we didn't protect our content. Uh, we uh, decided that what was more important was to um, get as many eyeballs as possible um, instead of trying to figure out how we could have a relationship with the people that we were um, serving. And so we are in the midst of this enormous transformation right now, where all of a sudden, because of what is happening actually to social media, they are also, if you've seen Facebook stocks numbers today, um, having a bit of a rough time themselves. Um, we are in the middle of trying to figure out what it's going to look like next. We've given away some of our power, actually, by um, using these other platforms to connect us to you. 
And so um, that has become an enormous problem. We don't have a way to pay for ourselves. ProPublica is a wonderful model. NPR is a wonderful model. We, in, we invented that kind of um, listener-engaged support of, of, uh, of journalism, but it, it can't, be the, can't be the only model. It won't support the entire ecosystem. Um, so what do we have instead? We have benefactors coming in, like Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post. And if they're benevolent benefactors, you get great journalism. So wonderful for the Washington Post. They're doing a, a wonderful job. They're hiring lots. Um, they're, they're really a robust news organization. And if you don't have a benevolent billionaire, um, you see what happens to places like the LA Times um, that you know, that was owned briefly by a billionaire and, and other news organizations that have been bought by people with a lot of money. And so it is a concern um, because how do you maintain your independence, your integrity, um, when you are at play in, in, a, in a political sense as well? So, you know, you have very wealthy people now buying Time Magazine, the Koch brothers, um, for example, have have invested heavily um, in Time or Newsweek, I'm not sure, but um, but one, you know, but that whole media enterprise. And so it's really, really hard to decide how to confront that. What do we do? And so, of course, when you're out there, you're asking, well, how do we trust you? If there are these shadowy forces behind you, what is their agenda? Uh, how can we believe what you put out? How is that credible? Um, you say, like, the things that he just said. You know, we don't, uh, you know, there's no facts. You're just trying to get clicks. And so it's a conversation that we're having amongst ourselves and, and with our audience. I noticed that you once worked for the Voice of America. Do you think there's still a role for the Voice of America? Huh. I was a freelancer at Voice of America when I started off, started my career. It was a very different organization than, than what I understand it to be now, but I, I don't actually... Um, follow them very quickly, very closely. I think they've been going also through a rough time. Um, I think, so I come from a background that's really interesting. I spent uh, my, the beginning of my career in the United Kingdom and I worked for the BBC. And the BBC, uh, World Service in particular, is, is the same sort of model that Voice of America has, except that it's run very differently because um, their editorial independence is paramount. Um, their funding is um, protected. And even though th they can have variations, but it is protected. Um, you pay for the BBC more broadly in the United Kingdom through um, something called a television license. Everyone actually, if you own a television set in the United Kingdom, has to pay this license, and that supports the work of the BBC. The World Service is financed by um, it's the foreign ministry in the, in, the, uh, in the UK, but their funding is protected. You know, VOA, uh, not so much. I mean, you worked in the State Department, you, you know that. VOA, um, not so much. Is there a role for it? I think there's a role, um, certainly, uh, as long as its editorial independence is protected. So we're gonna mix up the serious with, we have a couple lighter questions, and we had several of these. Do you get nervous when it's time for the Sunday puzzle? Ha! <laughs> oh my goodness. So I'll tell you a funny story about the Sunday puzzle. Um, it's so it's such an institution at Weekend Edition Sunday, and I am terrible at puzzles. And so I desperately tried to negotiate when I came on the show, and I was like, listen, you know, I don't want to do it. Why don't I just introduce Will and the guest, and I can just be there to help, and I don't have to do it. And I was, and and they, and it was made very apparent to me, um, clear to me that they said, you know, you try and change the puzzle, and. Uh, your stint at Weekend Edition Sunday will be very short. <laughs> will is much more powerful than I am. <laughs> um, and that was made even doubly clear when I said, okay, fine, all right, all right, but can we shake it up? Can we get a celebrity in, you know? Let's do a celebrity puzzle. Let's, let's kind of get someone in and, and, and sort of make it a little bit, you know, looser and fun. And so they were like, all right, all right, you know, let's, let's see, she's a new host, let's try it. We get these guests on. And, um, and the hate mail. I mean, you think people are critical of our coverage <laughs> because we're too pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Oh my God, puzzle people, the mail. I started putting it up on the wall. 
It was, it was, it was so cruel. It was excoriating. And it finally, when I finally pulled the plug on the experiment was actually when I was walking into work one day and um, there were these two women on the sidewalk and they came up to me and because they saw I was going into NPR, we have, you can see that it's a big building and they said, oh, oh, do you work at NPR? And I said, yes, I do. And they said, oh, would we know you? And I said, uh, I don't know, my name is Lulu Garcia Navarro. Oh, and they said, oh, that's wonderful, I'm so excited. Lulu Garcia Navarro, I love your show. Hate the puzzle. What are you doing with the puzzle? What are you, didn't I just tell you, Cynthia, that puzzle thing with the celebrity, stop it, just stop it. I promptly marched up to um, our executive uh, producer and said, all right, no more. We're not doing the, uh, we're not doing the celebrity puzzle anymore. Yes, I can see that's pos yes, I can see that's popular. Our daughter is starting her Master's of Journalism this fall. What advice do you have for her? <laughs> Get a flak jacket. Um, so, um, okay. I can be funny about this, but I'm gonna be a little serious. I get a lot of questions like this um, from journalism organizations and from journalism students. And some people will say, don't do journalism, do something else. I mean, if you wanna go into journalism, you can do it, but don't do that. Don't do that because it's a nightmare. There's no jobs, they, everyone hates you. Um, they're mean to you, um, you know. You cry every night, sometimes. Um, I don't say that. Become a journalist, please, we need you. We need the next generation of young people who are willing to ask questions, who are willing to go out there and try and find out what's going on. We need the next generation of journalists. I am a huge believer, uh, and if I wasn't, I couldn't be standing here. I've spent my entire career doing this because I believe that what we do is actually vital. And yes, there are many problems with it, and yes, we should debate all of them but it is enormously important because I've been in countries where journalism does not exist in the way that we understand it. And I have seen what, what happens to those places. And it is nothing good. It is nothing good. Um, when you only have official, official lines of inquiry, uh, official statements coming uh, to a population, where people feel that they can't give their opinions, where things cannot be investigated, where there's no outlet for, con for something that concerns you to be broadcast to as many people as possible. Uh, that gives ultimate power to um, people who may not have the best interests of the, of, of the citizenry at, at heart. And so I would say, please, please become, journal become a journalist. And even if you don't go into journalism, even if you don't do it, the skills that you learn are invaluable. It teaches you to be skeptical. It teaches you to be critical. It teaches you to go up to people that you don't know and ask them really nosy questions in the most charming way. <laughs> it makes you a good dinner companion at the very least. And at best, what it makes you is part of an incredible democracy, an incredible democratic experiment. What is the next big disruptor technology-wise for news? Wait, do, do, do you know? Because if you know, I think I've got some money I can invest in. Um, oh my gosh. What is the next big disruptor? We are being disrupted by the disruptors who are disrupting themselves, who are like trying to figure out what the next disruptor is going to be. I, I, you know, it, it is, <laughs> we, it, it is so confusing and mind-boggling. I was, in fact, looking at the Pointer Institute, and they were saying the next big thing in news, and I didn't even understand what some of the things were. I, I um, one of the things they said was we're going to now have have algorithm um, investigators, journalists who investigate algorithms and how they operate, which I think is actually a really important thing. I'm making light of it, but I actually think it's really, really important because algorithms now not only determine the kind of news that you see, as I mentioned, but they determine the criminal things in the criminal justice system, how people get um, sentenced. They determine all sorts of things in, 
in ways big or small that you may not understand. And who are making those algorithms? You know, how are those algorithms being um, put together? So I think that, that it's really important. But what is the next disruptor of news? My goodness. Um, I think, you know, people. You guys. You guys, yeah, you. You're, you're the next disruptor of news. You're asking questions. You want to know the answers. You, you're skeptical. Um, you uh, have different tastes. You know, you ask why don't we have more foreign news? You don't click on it as much as you should. Um, you know? So uh, when you talk to people from CNN or from MSNBC or from Fox, you find, they'll, they'll tell you, why do you put this stuff on all the time? Why aren't you covering this or that story? And what they'll say is, we have a very direct understanding of what, in, what interests people. And that's ratings, and that's actually what you choose to consume. We know what you like. There's something really interesting that they do at NPR, that um, they ask listeners, when they're kind of canvassing a show, they ask listeners, what are the things that are important to you? And um, there's always these top answers, and it's like international news and politics, and at the bottom is like entertainment. And <laughs> it's really funny. And then we look at actually what people click on, and it's exactly inverted. <laughs> international news gets like no clicks, and then if it's something with a really interesting headline that has an animal in it, it's like over the moon. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> <laughs> you lie. So as a follow-up, and you touched a little bit of this in your talk, what do you think is the most or a couple of the most neglected subject, subject matters in the current landscape that aren't being clicked on besides international? I, I mean, uh, so I, I would say um, almost everything. <laughs> no, I, 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 I wish that wasn't a joke. Um, I can speak from my show. We've got two hours, um, and then it's cut up in all sorts of different ways. So there's funding notices, and there's all these different things. So we've got a limited amount of time. And then we go into uh, our meetings on a Tuesday and a Wednesday, and we can't actually decide what is going to be the news because we have no idea because of what our editor, Jordana Hochman, said, which was, 3 p.m. on a Friday, you're, you're sure that something cataclysmic is going to happen and everything's going to change. And so we leave the top blank, <laughs> you know, which is unprecedented. Usually you would have all that sort of nailed down, but we just kind of leave it there and it says hole, H-O-L-E. And it's there, these blank spaces that just sit there glaring at you, <laughs> waiting for news to happen. And so that space is already taken up by something, right? That we don't even know what it's going to be because we have to give you the news. We're a news organization. And then we have to give you joy and happiness because if not, I would kill myself um, because I have to sit in the studio and, uh, and talk and listen to the program and I don't want to only have depressing conversations or tough conversations or sad conversations. And so where does that leave all these other stories? And where does that leave all these other parts of the country? Uh, and, and so what are the things that we're missing? You know, where are we not going? And it turns out so many places. Personally for me, if you ask me what is the most important thing that we're missing, I would say the voices of Hispanics, minorities. Uh, news is overwhelmingly white. 75% of newsrooms are white. We're often missing the voices of women, uh, even though you'd think in this particular climate that wasn't true. Uh, about most news programs, uh, not, not only at NPR, but just generally, uh, have only about 25% uh, female participation. So most of the voices you'll hear are men, and most of those voices are white men. So I would say that those are the, the stories and the voices that we're, we're most missing. So you talked about your unsuccessful change of the puzzle, but on a more serious note, what are you doing to be a rebel to change the news within your weekend show? A rebel. 
Mm. Um, so I came with a very specific remit uh, for me, and this was just my own thing. Uh, I came, well, first of all, I, want, I, I came uh, not really expecting the news climate that we're in. That, that's the first thing. I came from a country, Brazil, which had just impeached its president, um, had just gone through a Olympics in Rio um, that had bankrupted the city, um, a country that was being ravaged by the Zika virus. So I was coming here thinking this is going to be fine. Um, it'll be great. Things will be good. Uh, so, but the thing that I felt that I really wanted to do is move away from the, some of the stuff that I talked about. I, I, I think this moment that we're in where we're all talking to each other and you see the pundits on and every side, and they're glib, and they're great, and I love listening to them because it gives me all sorts of insight into the political mach machinations. But I try and privilege the voices of people. Um, I really think that those are the stories that I've always wanted to hear as a reporter outside of this country, and those are the stories that I want to hear now. People often ask me, how do you find a story? I, I got asked that at a dinner party the other night, and we've been talking for a while. And I went around the table, and I said, you're a story because you've told me this thing, and you're a story because you've said that to me, and you're a story because you've said that to me. And I went and I told, and I did that with every single person because if you listen, everyone's a story. I was just today um, at uh, the hair salon, and um, and the stylist was telling me her story about all sorts of things that I was like, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, about Yelp reviews and how they work and about um, the problems that, are, that she's facing here in downtown. And there were all sorts of things that I was listening to her and thinking, well, that fits into a really interesting bigger narrative. And so I think that often what we're missing is just the stories of real people and how all these policies, all these things that are happening in Washington affect people in different parts of the country. And so those are the things that I think are, really matter. And I wish we'd stick, things with, stick with things a little longer. We get tired really fast, and we don't go back to the stories in the way that we should. So we had a couple questions about the Me Too movement and how it affects news. And uh, maybe you could just comment on, we've had a number of stories in various uh, uh, outlets, including NPR, but um, if you could just touch on, on that. I think the Me Too movement is enormously consequential. Um, I think it is, I've felt it uh, in our own news organization, uh, transforming uh, some of the ways in which we deal uh, with each other at work. I had this incredible moment actually when I was out reporting in Pennsylvania and I was talking to um, a union worker who was uh, Italian American. I say this because it becomes relevant in a moment. And he's very gregarious and he's very charming. And he reaches out to touch me and then he says, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't want to upset you. And he said it kind of tongue in cheek. And he's like, you know, I'm Italian. I would touch you feel it. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm Latin. I'm touchy feel it too. No, 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 f no offense taken. It's all good. But I thought about how that had sort of trickled down to just this casual interaction that I was having and how all of a sudden he understood that maybe invading someone's space needed to be asked, there needed to be some sort of consent. And, you know, we're all trying to figure out right now uh, what that means, um, what is the spectrum of grievances and how they should be dealt with. Uh, our news organization in particular uh, has faced its challenges. We are not alone in that. But I have seen it really uh, have an enormous impact and in small ways and big. And I think it's, it's a really important thing. And I, and I think, uh, you know, we'll have to see where it goes. But there are really deep and important conversations that we're having at the moment. Because the fact of the matter is, is as, as women, and we know this, we still get paid 70 cents to the dollar. Uh, we're still not represented in the way that we should be at, at the top of companies. Uh, we still uh, are not represented in politics. 
um, our political representation in this country is appalling. So this is a necessary conversation that we're having and long overdue. As the Snapchat generation finds its voice and possibly chooses. Snapchat's over, sorry. <laughs> Didn't you hear? Snapchat's done, Kylie Jenner killed it, sorry. And Rihanna. As the Instagram generation. <laughs> in any event, um, how do you as a journalist draw them into stories that have different threads deeper, more context. I mean, this was touched on in the audio clips, uh, I think especially that Ari said, that you used to be able to go back several times and look at a story from different angles. And how do you do that now, not only with the amount of news, but with... Uh, Attention folks, spans exactly. and the way people consume news. Well, this is what I mean when you guys, when I said you guys are the biggest disruptors, right? Um, you guys are the biggest disruptors. It's it, because people are making things um, and you are using them in all sorts of interesting ways and you are adopting them or not adopting them and the next generation is incredibly adept at, at picking something up and then dropping it at the, <laughs> at the, um, you know, at the drop of a hat. Uh, I make a joke about Snapchat but it is astonishing um, that, that basically all of a sudden it's become not cool within the past three weeks. And they've seen <laughs> an enormous drop off in their traffic. And Facebook is going through a huge um, moment. And I don't know where that'll shake out. I actually don't know where that'll shake out. And what'll be the next social media platform that will come in? And meantime, we are trying as journalists um, to figure it all out and to get our content out there in the way that you can understand it. And so I have to tell you, um, you know, my Snapchat stories were never very good, and I'm, I'm sort of happy that I might not have to reach out in that forum anymore. Um, but what is the next forum? Am I going to be in a hologram? I don't know. Um, it's, oh, I know what it is. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, so I don't know if you guys have been listening to NPR, but we now have to say this thing, which is like, ask your smart speaker to play NPR or your local station. So that's our new thing, the smart speaker. So that's, that's the thing. So I've had to record special smart speaker content so you can say, Lulu, tell me about <laughs> the stock market crashing. And then I'll be like, well. And then I have like a little thing that I say. So there's some like weird fake interactiveness that, that, that is supposed to happen there. And we're trying to figure out how to do that because you can interact with your smart speaker and you can ask it stuff. You can ask Alexa stuff. My daughter likes to do it all the time. Alexa answers back sometimes ridiculously, but you know, there's this kind of feeling that there's a rapport and we're trying to figure out, well, how do we get in there? How do we own that? Um, and so they're trying to like make us there's like little mini Lulus that are gonna go into your smart speaker. At some point, you're gonna be able to talk to me. So yeah, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you touched on this a little bit, but can you dive in a little more about how a layperson can support good journalism besides being a member of OPB? Yes, support your local member station. Yeah. Um, how you can support good journalism? Yeah. Ah. Well, I kind of told you a little bit about that, but um, pay for your news, pay for your news. We did a terrible thing at the advent of the digital tsunami, which was we accustomed our readers and our listeners um, and our viewers to not pay for their news. We find, you know, people now find it irritating when we have paywalls, they find it irritating when we ask them for money, um, it's, it's annoying. Uh, and, I, you know, my niece works in the hotel industry and I'm always complaining to her because it's like, I have to check in at four and then I'm getting kicked out at 11 and now you're charging me if I stay an hour over and it's monetized in all these amazing ways and we in the media <laughs> can't even get a dollar um, from people sometimes to pay for an article that they want to read that's relevant to them. And so I would say number one is pay for your news. Pay for it. And the second thing I would say is make sure that the news that you're supporting 
is something that's meaningful to you. And it doesn't have to be a big news organization. It doesn't have to be the Washington Post or the New York Times or, you know, it, it can be all sorts of different things because there are different voices out there. There are different voices out there doing important work that aren't, you know, huge mega organizations. And if you find something that's, that's worthy, you should nurture it and you should try and support it. Um, and you should amplify it. And then the third thing I'd say, and this I guess goes back to the social media thing, is share things that you know will, that are true and that you know will um, be for the greater good, for people's greater understanding. Uh, don't just share things because they score a partisan point. You know, I, I have, I come from a, div a divided family. I have Trump supporters, on the one hand, I have liberals on the other, I have never Trumpers, we have all sorts of different types of people in our family. And the only thing that they agree on actually is that they hate me in the media. So <laughs> dinner parties are really fun for me. But what I've always, but I, but my newsfeed is really varied. It's, it's really varied. I get, I, I see a lot of different types of stuff coming through. And that's good for me, but I think it's disheartening generally because they're always posting things that, that sort of support a point of view that they already have and that don't challenge it. And so I would say, why don't you post things that maybe made you think, made you wonder? Um, if you don't agree with it, maybe you should explain why. But don't just post things that, that support your particular point of view because Ultimately, we are in these echo chambers, and it isn't good for our democracy. Oh, and be civil, be nice. I really believe that. Are your days of conflict reporting behind you, and how does it feel when you go out as a host do something remotely after being back in Washington now? Feels great. <laughs> um, so the thing about being a foreign correspondent is that every day is different. You wake up in the morning and you are going to do any number of different things. You're always outside. You're always talking to people. You're always interacting and traveling. The thing about being a host is that is exactly not true. <laughs> you go in, I go to my office, I go from my office to the studio to record something, I come back to my office, I go back to the office, back to the studio, you know, it's, it's, it's from here to there. Um, and so uh, I have learned to free my mind because I'm having all these incredible conversations and I'm, as I like to say, rediscovering America one conversation at a time and it's an extraordinary privilege. I think my days of conflict reporting are over. Uh, I have a daughter, first of all, and I don't want to make her um, worry. And also, I think there's a new generation. I think I th it's not because I don't think it's valuable. There are some days when I listen to certain reports from places and I think, I wish I were there. It's still a part of my blood. I've, I, that's mostly what I did. But I think I enjoy very much what I'm doing now. Um, being with Will Shorts on the puzzle is kind of like being in a war zone. <laughs> some some Sundays, um, especially when he yeah, especially when he gets the geography wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't think I'd go back to it, but I think that um, I think that I do take the show on the road, and that was the other thing that I've been trying to do a lot more is is take the show out of the studio, go somewhere, explore you know, a particular place, a particular set of issues, try and understand it, um, because it, it is important for us as hosts and, and also just the staff themselves to, to go out and see things. You know, I work with a lot of young people um, who, who are often straight out of college. This is their first journalism job. They're learning journalism um, by working on, on a show like Weekend Edition or All Things Considered or Morning Edition. Um, and that's an amazing responsibility. And one of the things that I've learned with them is that when I take them out and, and they see how journalism is practiced in the field, it's very different. Uh, we went to cover the hurricane in Miami, Hurricane Irma, and one of the producers said, oh, you can just show up 
and people will talk to you? you don't have to call and sort of write a letter. And I was like, because we do things. We're sitting in offices and we're calling people the whole time. And I was like, no, most of journalism is actually just show up and say, hi, could you talk to me? And sometimes, and most of the times people will. So for our last question on the hurricane, um, we had several people in the audience ask about this. If you could tell the story about the little dog that you rescued. Kiko. Um, the reason I say Kiko, is that the story of Kiko has ended up with a lot of chewed furniture peed on carpets. <laughs> <laughs> um, and me floating the question to my daughter, hey, if Kiko we were to go back to Miami and the beach, would you feel bad? <laughs> I do love Kiko, but Kiko has caused a great deal of damage to my house. Um, so Kiko, for those of you who may not know, um, was a puppy that was found in Miami after the storm. And I was doing a story, as all good journalists must do, on how the animals survived the hurricane. Um, when I went to the animal shelter, and all of a sudden, this young girl showed up, uh, this young woman showed up. Uh, she said she'd found this little puppy in the park, and it was this tiny little terrier thing, and it was bedraggled. And it was about three months old, and it was so cute. And my daughter has been, we have an older rescue dog, and I believe in rescue dogs. And, um, and I, my daughter was like, oh gosh, you know, please, I want a puppy, I want a puppy. And I felt like she was old enough now, responsible enough. So I was like, oh, okay, this seems like it's a gift. This will be the puppy that I bring home. And I took Kiko in my arms, and he licked me, and it was beautiful. And you know, and then I filled out the paperwork and I was, and they said, you have to wait a couple weeks because we have to see if Kiko's actually got an owner somewhere and then you can take him. So I wait two weeks, I fly back down to Miami and I'm really excited and I'm so thrilled. And the first inklings of what was about to come my way were made apparent to me when I asked the uh, woman who was sort of taking care of Kiko, um, how Kiko had been. And she said, well, you know, I t he was so cute and I, I knew you were gonna take him, so I took him back to my house. And then I kinda didn't, I took him back here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really, Wh why? why? Well, you know, he kind of ate all my computer cords and pooed on my carpet and actually scrabbled a hole through the wall of my bedroom, and I was like, really, but he's so small. And then I go upstairs, and there's Kiko, and they've given him this, his own little sort of padded cell. Um, <laughs> with all this padding and like a million toys, but he is like in quarantine. Um, and I was told, and not very uh, graciously, that he had escaped a few times and had gone into the director's office where he had wreaked havoc. But I was still enamored by Kiko. And I took Kiko home and I opened the door and my daughter didn't know that I was bringing home a puppy. And you know that thing that happens when your child says, mommy, you got me a puppy. And they love each other and they sleep together every night. And I still think about ways of sending him back to Miami. <laughs> 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 and that is the story of Kiko. <laughs> And join me in one last round of applause for our great guest tonight. Thank you.